I do want to point out, I, I, I don't want to sound uh, hostile to this uh, merger because I, I really think that the government needs to uh, stay as much out of uh, the business world as possible. But I have had some concerns raised by constituents and uh, some interest groups that I have agreed to uh, uh, talk to you guys about. And I think that's the purpose of this hearing is to get the stuff on the table. And, you know, one of my concerns is that uh, I learned last week that a combined Comcast Time Warner cable will serve 91% of the Hispanic households in the U.S. and will be the top distributor in 19 out of the 20 top Hispanic uh, marketers. We know that you guys own uh, Telemundo, one of the current providers of uh, Spanish language programming. Uh, and uh, along with what Mr. Johnson was asking, uh, what assurances can you give us that uh, you won't uh, discriminate against non-Comcast, uh, uh, NBC Universal owned programming <coughs> produced by other companies, and do you have internal procedures in place to prevent that kind of discrimination? So um, I should have waited for your follow-up. I would have been able to give a more complete answer. So first of all, we've not been able to verify those numbers just for, just for the record. Um, but I've observed before in this transaction that sometimes big is bad, and I understand that, but sometimes big is good. And sometimes big is very good. And when you have a company like Comcast, which has this extraordinary commitment to diverse programming, but in particular to Hispanic and Hispanic theme programming, covering a greater percentage of the Hispanic population in the United States is a really good thing. Because we'll bring that commitment to those communities in the same way we've brought it to the current Comcast footprint. So we have a significant commitment to carrying Hispanic programming. Um, we, as I said, we carry 58 Hispanic or Hispanic-themed cable channels currently. That include, and we have, we have retransmission consent, a long-term retransmission consent agreement with Univision, and we carry eight Univision networks. So uh, yeah, I guess, you know, here, here's, here, here's, this kind of follows up on my overall concern about the difficulty for uh, new programmers to break in uh, to the market. The uh, Univision Sports Network is a perfect example. They're actually, I think, not on y'all's stations, but they end up the number one Spanish language sports. So it, it kind of argues against uh, being good business to have it on there. You hear uh, Mr. Gotch here testify about the fact that his ratings uh, in markets where he was removed from your uh, cable system were higher than some of the other channels uh, that, that you own. So. It, I guess the, the level of vertical integration there, the fact that NBC owns so many stations <coughs> uh, that would potentially compete right, with so the... So let, let me respond to that. And fortunately for us, this is one of the most litigated issues that exists in antitrust law, and that is the percentage of the market that a single company can have before there is a risk that it can foreclose content to its consumers. Twice the FCC had extended proceedings to determine what was that percentage of the market? Twice they concluded that if a cable company had, if one cable company had more than 30 percent of the market, there would be an undue risk of that company serving as a bottleneck or extorting pro improper pricing from channels. One um, of the, yeah. I mean, twice yeah. the D.C. Circuit struck that down, finding that 30 percent, that there was no evidence that of the 30 percent share a cable company would be able to control the market. We are coming in below 30 percent. The answer to the question is that any cable channel has more than 70 percent of the rest of the company to be, of the rest of the country to be able to go after right. it. I'm running out of time. Quick, and I, okay, go ahead. But I'm running out of time here. One quick, the protection that exists is the program act, is the program carriage rules. There are legal rules that prevent us from discriminating against a new channel or an existing channel in favor of content that we own. So that is something that already exists under the yep. law. We're not allowed to do it. One of, the, one of the mitigating factors, I think, that is actually going to gain you support in this is as new technologies are developing out and you're getting more competing cable companies, you've got Fios competing, uh, you've got Google Fiber coming in, there, there are going to be more options in the short term. But I'm also concerned about the programming. Uh, I'll use an example from... Uh, from Corpus Christi, where I live, um, we have two cable companies. We have Time Warner and we have uh, Grande. You guys own the uh, Comcast owns the rights to the Astros baseball games. 
I would assume there's not going to be a lot of incentive there for you to sell the rights to carry the Astros baseball game for, you know, a, a, a few cents or a buck a subscriber to uh, Grande when you can use it to bring in, you know, $100 internet cable phone in the years. How, how are we going to address the issue of fair access to your program? And that could be taken to the extreme that say, all right, well, we're going to pull NBC and Bravo and E2, or we're going to jack them up to competing cable companies or Fios in the same market. So I, I smile only because I wish we had that problem with the Houston Regional Sportsnet and that your are Well, it's partly the Astros' fault. They're not, not doing very well. You really wanted to watch the Astros. That would, that would like be good news for that network. But the Houston RSN is a perfect example, um, really, of why the fear about our control of this um, is, is, is overstated. That network is really controlled by the two teams, by both the Astros and the Rockets. Um, we're, we have a minority ownership interest in it. We manage it. Um, but they control the pricing of the network. They control the distribution of it. But again, even if that were not true and we were controlling that, you ha you ha that's, on the, that's on the program access side. So you have the program access rules. And I'd note that under the NBC Universal order, a small cable company that doesn't like the terms that are being offered actually has a right of arbitration just on that regional sports net without any other programs, without any other cable channels bundled with it. Well, I see I've run the red light, so we'll uh, move along. I'll have a couple more questions in the, yeah, thank you. In the second round of questioning for some of the other uh, members of the panel. <laughs> but I do join with the gentlelady uh, from Houston uh, in, in saying we're looking forward to getting our uh, our sports situation resolved. It bleeds down into Corpus Christi as well. You know, I'm a customer of both Time Warner and, uh, and of Comcast. Uh, Corpus Christi is Time Warner, and my apartment here in D.C. is uh, Comcast. I'm actually looking forward to the improved Internet performance in Corpus Christi and these dropped packets and uh, network resets I keep getting every few months. So that's one thing I'm really looking forward to in this merger. Uh, mm -hmm. And I do want to uh, go... Uh, align myself with Mr. Gomert if, if it comes out you guys are making uh, programming decisions politically based, I think there's going to be a problem. Uh, and I, I, I certainly hope that uh, is not the case. Uh, I did want to talk about uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of issues that were uh, brought up. Mr. Schaefer, you mentioned that the cost of adding additional ports, uh, the hardware was trivial, but there's more to it than uh, just hardware, isn't it? I mean, you've actually got to get the pipes. So uh, Comcast has sold its customer service that if those customers actually use the service at the rates that Comcast has sold it, their network would fail to operate. So in order to mask that problem, they have limited the boundary capacity between their network and the public Internet to help reduce consumers' use of broadband. Right, but that, so this actually, though, makes their deal with Netflix sound good. They've immediately opened up 30% more bandwidth at your peering points, right? Because Netflix isn't coming through your peering points. But there is so much additional traffic beyond Netflix that wishes to go to Comcast paying customers that those ports still remain constrained. Well, let's, Mr. Cohen, that, I mean, that kind of makes it, makes you guys look like uh, bad guys. I, you know, I'm geek enough that I'll run speed tests, and I do much better when I stay uh, on the. You know, if I go to the Time Warner Speed Ru Roadrunner speed test, I do much better than if I go somewhere else. Just the same happens if I stay on the Comcast network. Uh, I do better. In order to offer that high-speed uh, internet, you, you got to get your peering in order. Is that? Yeah. Our. I mean, I'm, I want to say this again. I mean, our our peering is in order. Uh, we are good citizens in the peering network, in, in the peering world. Uh, we work very hard to work with all peering partners, whether it's settlement-free peering or paid transit. We, as, as, as Professor Hemphill said, this is not headline news. This is Y'all actually do do better than Time yeah. Warner. I'm going right. to be honest about that. Apologies to the folks down in, uh, right. in but all, Christie, I mean, right? I really think we are good citizens and we have good arrangements. And, um, the, the issues that we have had have been truly isolated, and we've worked very hard to be able to resolve those without ever depearing a partner of ours on the, uh, on, on the, in the interconnect. I've got a couple other questions, and I'm running out of time. I, but uh, I, 
you, you have your uh, boxes, all your cable folks. I think you, you're almost entirely digital now, where almost everybody, you have very few subscribers who don't have a cable box. Is that correct? Well, we, we are 100% digital, so right. yes, you need some type of a cable, cable card box or a box. For, or a converter box for every television. Now, do you have the ability then to poll those boxes to see how many people are watching what channel for what time? So um, this is, with the advent of big data, this is beginning to be something that we're looking at and beginning to focus on. We probably do have the technological ability to do that, but as you may know, cable is subject to intense and restrictive privacy protections and privacy restrictions that go far beyond what applies on the internet, for example, with what Google and Yahoo can do with the data that they obtain. So, but we could eventually customers. get the data, you would know. So when Mr. Gotch says he's got more viewers and uh, some of your other people, you should have picked somebody else in Denver. I mean, the technology is to the point, you just don't have it all implemented. That is, that is correct. All right, and then I also wanted to go back to, uh, actually, I'll stick with you for a second, Mr. Cohen. Do you see, the increase in video traffic on the network going up. Do you see a shift from this model of where you're watching TV in real time to where you're pulling something from uh, Netflix and the, where the entertainment program becomes more on demand? And does this help or hurt your bandwidth issues? Right, so, so far what we're seeing, we have to break this down in a slightly different way, I think. We're seeing tremendously increased utilization of online video services, but we are not seeing a degradation in the amount of time that people watch television and watch video on demand, which is a part of our Title VI cable service. Yeah, so it's and been, I, and I guess, I guess been my, more a growth of the pie than a difference in a, in a share of the pie. And so I guess my, my point is, in making program decisions and, uh, and operating in the public interest, I know that's kind of an archaic term in FCC uh, lingo, but sports programming, news programming, stuff that needs to be live, seems like there ought to be more availability and bandwidth on your cable dedicated to that sort of programming as opposed to stuff that you could get through alternative mes methods on demand that isn't as time sensitive. We could go into that, but I am out of time. Okay. I did want to uh, uh, suggest that that be something that be considered and it might be something that the FCC the, the only quick thing I'll observe because it's the second time you've made reference to this is please don't under count, underestimate the amount of sports programming in particular that is now available online. So Major League Baseball has a package online. You can watch any Major League Baseball game. NBA, the same thing. NCAA playoffs was all available online as well as on television. So I just, yeah. I just love my Longhorn that goes network. into your thinking. I, I love my Longhorn network. <laughs> right. Thank you very much.